Superb. Thank you for that. And by the way, and thank you uh, to OMG for inviting me to come and speak at this fantastic event in this wonderful location. And, uh, and good morning to you all. Okay, so what I'm going to be talking about this morning um, is one key thing, and obviously that is pattern recognition, but from the point of how it connects to an issue that is basically impacting, I think, everyone in the room today, and all the businesses and all the categories that, that you yourselves are actually link linking into. And obviously that is volatility. So volatility, the key buzzword that's being used at just about every event that we go to globally, is being talked about in an era where speed and agility are the only games in town. So from the point of view of what I'll speak about this morning, I'll cover off three key issues. The first stop is a sharing culture, then an on-demand economy, and then I'll talk about why less is more is the next big thing. Okay, so to uh, crack on. First of all, and what I've got here, by the way, are just purely four slides, so I'm not going to be sort of uh, inundating you with information, so hopefully it's going to be fairly, uh, there'll be a lot of clarity here. The key thing about a sharing culture that has been one of the sort of buzzwords of the last uh, sort of couple of years has been from the point of view of what's mine is yours for a fee. So the idea that the internet has managed to leverage something that is an age-old sort of dawn of humanity trend, sharing, borrowing, but it's basically enabled it to be used by startups around the world to massive success and sort of you know, seemingly unending um, uh, ability to, to make more and do better is quite extraordinary. So this idea I think we're seeing now is this. It's that access trumps ownership. And access trumping ownership is a fundamental shift in consumer uh, behavior and consumer patterns. So in its most obvious format, what are we seeing? Naturally, you and I may use it from the point of view of the brand that one has to mention straight away, Airbnb. So you and I use it from the point of view of an asset. So we'll, you know, um, so we'll share, we'll borrow uh, a stranger's accommodation to use when we're traveling, we're on holiday, potentially when we're on business. Others may use it, let's say, from the point of view of uh, brands like Upwork to uh, sell, um, say their, uh, sell their services, to go away and uh, perhaps work on our laptop or mow your lawn. Um, we'll see uh, other brands like Visit, for instance, when we're in a foreign capital. We might decide to go and have a, uh, a genuine and authentic meal with a stranger, cooked by a stranger in their own home. So this idea of access trumping ownership is absolutely extraordinary. And what are we seeing? I think one statistic really, really amazes me. Two-thirds of the world's population are interested in renting or sharing out their assets or their services for financial reward. A similar number are interested in using exactly that from strangers for the same reasons. So this idea that sharing is now becoming or has been leveraged by the internet on a global basis to take a completely standard social norm whereby we, we can all access it and use it is absolute, absolutely fundamental. I say it's fundamentally changing consumption from the point of view of desire and demand. Another area that I think is really interesting is this. So the idea that we've seen so far in sharing and the way that, um, let's say, a sharing economy has been reported on and used on and all of those trend reports that no doubt come across your desks the entire time is this. The idea of um, a perceived audience. And the perceived audience, let's say, so far for a sharing economy has been much like yourselves. So obviously incredibly young and stylish, um, the idea of being sort of, you know, urban hipsters and whatever, and sort of, you know, perhaps you know, millennials or, or Gen Xers, um, buying into a sharing model. But the idea that the model is urban um, and youthful and stylish is fundamentally out of date. Because again, what are we seeing? I think Nielsen recently famously reported, and I think it's an economist uh, uh, very recently, and also reported in magazines like Wired, um, that basically about 60% of the global's population, again, are interested in borrowing and sharing, but not on the basis of 60% of that perceived existing audience, but an audience that is genuinely pan-demographic, completely um, crosses geographical boundaries and crosses age groups. So the idea that now basically everybody, or just about everybody, roughly say 60% of uh, people in 60 countries are buying into a sharing economy is fundamentally altering how people are accessing, um, accessing brands and accessing products. Another key point 
that is, I think is absolutely fascinating is this issue of the consumer value equation. So consumer value equation so far has tended to look at a sharing culture from the point of view of dropping price. The idea that I'll buy into that sharing economy because prices are being driven down. That is absolutely changing. And so for a couple of examples, what are we seeing? For instance, let's say the transport world, the motor world. What are we now seeing is that potential, let us say, um, Lyft driver will now look at, rather than trading down, will actually trade up. So rather than, let's say, going for a basic model 5 series BMW or, or, or an equal, let's say, sort of Nissan, is actually moving upscale. And why? Because they can see that the, that the potential audience for that, for that asset use, for that sharing asset use, will be more interested in sharing that asset if the quality is higher. So just as we're seeing, for instance, home ownership changing, if you're in the real estate market in Dubai or elsewhere, what are you seeing? A potential, uh, a potential purchaser of that real estate may be looking at, let's say, a three-bedroom um, bit of real estate um, rather than a two-bedroom, again, for its perceived return on investment. We're seeing the same thing in the fashion world. I mean, I do a lot of work there. Um, I lecture back, back in London at London College of Fashion. And what are we seeing that the potential fashion purchaser of a high-end fashion item may well, again, be either going up market or on the other side, we're also, also seeing, let's say, the diametric opposite, the com complete polarity here, whereby people may be foregoing ownership completely. Again, coming back to the consumer value equation. So from the point of view of um, purchase, should I go to the top end of the scale in any particular sector, or should I forego ownership completely? Why buy at all if I'm an urban-based worker? Why buy a new vehicle? Why not just constantly share? I think this week, The Economist have done a, uh, put out a fantastic report um, focused very much on Uber, because they have to, and talk about Uber world um, from an angle of a company that is absolutely altering um, individual ownership. And what are they looking at? And what potentially, uh, and there's an amazing, amazing statistic put out by the OECD last month that said that potentially, from the point of view of autonomous vehicle um, ownership or autonomous vehicle usage, if sharing vehicles on an autonomous basis really takes off, and Uber are absolutely wanting to own this market, then the potential impact on our roads can be an 80% plus reduction in the amount of cars on the road from the point of view of ownership. 80% plus, the impact on the motor industry could not be more significant. And in terms of autonomous vehicle ownership, we know all about, we've all seen those reports about um, Google cars and all the rest. So that market, in terms of genuinely altering society, is fundamentally um, having, is potentially, potentially going to have a huge impact. Another sort of a, a area linked to it is, let's say, just the use of space, public space. A lot of American cities, again, as reported by The Economist and by the OECD, have up to 20% of the actual land usage taken by parked vehicles. So again, if this issue of autonomous vehicle usage takes off, the amount of land given back to the general public by not having cities choked with vehicles is absolutely extraordinary. So what does it all mean? Well, elsewhere, what are we seeing? Things like the gig economy. So the gig economy is, I think, in terms of, let's say, the, 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 the virtual um, uh, human cloud is, again, having huge impact. And why? So moving on from things like uh, a, a strict um, uh, sharing economy, which is also a sharing culture, which is linked into the circular economy, the circular economy obviously is lo looking at this from a point of view of, and this is, I think, people at like London Business School, for instance, have done a lot of work into this area, that is basically moving on from a situation whereby an old-style linear model of the economy, make, use, destroy, discard, is in instead being completely turned on its head by adding to it issues like reuse, reshare, recycle. But from the point of view of the gig economy and the virtual human cloud, what are we seeing? Well, in terms of actually impacting not only how we're using assets, how we're using products, and how we're linking with each other, it's also fundamentally altering not only how we work, but how we live our lives. So the gig economy enables that annoying hipster in Williamsburg 
to basically compete with that tech expert in Bangalore to, let's say, redo or update your site. Um, this is also is having a huge impact on the brands that are linking into it. I mentioned Uber already. Um, another issue that is really impacting on those brands that essentially have come to market in a very unregulated way, and those brands tend to come to market from the point of view of just do it and then let the regulators, let the authorities catch up later, which is why the authorities have had such a problem with brands like Uber. But we've seen one thing really trip them up, and that is ethics, the ethical agenda. So what have we seen recently? So Uber have been uh, very much under the spotlight from the point of view of the way they treat their drivers. Um, in terms of drivers now demanding holiday pay and sickness benefit and all the rest of it, we're seeing uh, brands like Deliveroo, currently in a city near you, wherever you are, um, being taken into account by their delivery um, personnel on the basis, again, of, um, of their ethical stance and the way they treat their workers. Um, and so the angle of um, regulation possibly catching up with and really nailing some of these major plays in the gig economy is, I think, a really, really big issue. Um, but certainly, I say that issue of, the, uh, of that culture or that area being the future and being really, really bought into by, I say, up to two thirds of the world's population is, I think, a clear example of a genuine, major, macro, global trend crossing barriers, crossing boundaries, working on a completely pan demographic basis. Moving on to the uh, next one, and um, uh, this, I think, is again fascinating the on demand economy. Now, the on-demand economy I'll look at through a couple of ways. Let's say a classic example of how this is huge is the healthcare market, or the healthcare industry, if you like. Um, so what are we seeing there? For instance, the rise of um, uh, avatars, the rise of chatbots, um, the idea that you can link into a virtual um, um, nurse or doctor via your smartphone. Nothing new there, you might argue, because I mean, obviously we've seen things like the mindfulness trend, which is, has been everywhere over the last, let's say, 18 months with brands like Budify doing very, very well um, in terms of helping people to live in the moment. Um, um, elsewhere, the quantified self, the QS market is huge, and obviously the idea of wearables, nothing new there at all, taken over, uh, it was operating all over the world. I've done a lot of research into that area. But where it's really taking off is this, and that is the way that we're now seeing supercomputers um, going through machine reading a massive amount of biometric data to enable um, a, an understanding of, let's say, diagnostics or disease diagnosis to be speeded up on a scale of accuracy, which is extraordinary. So what are we seeing, for instance, here? So um, um, in terms of diagnostics, and by the way, sorry, in terms of disease diagnosis, what you're seeing very, very swiftly is a sort of 90% plus rate of accuracy in diagnosing what disease it is that the patient may have. On average, I would excuse with apologies to any doctors in the room, um, I think on average where people tend to say it's about a 60-65% accuracy rate that you tend to get from a very, very high-end um, sort of a human. However, machine reading is really, really altering all of this. So what are we seeing? Well, basically, so how does this operate in reality? So if you or I injure ourselves, feeling unwell, we tend to do one of three things. So we'll either go online, check the internet, or we'll call emergency services, or we'll go to a, to a, to a hospital um, A&R department. The first is inaccurate, because there's so much rubbish, obviously, spoken online. The second and third are incredibly expensive. And from the point of view of health services around the world, how is this impacting on them? Well, they tend to see us, bluntly put, the human, as being the most expensive part of that whole healthcare agenda. Um, and so how is this going to alter it? Well, what it's going to do is speed up the process and put in a massive amount of accuracy um, to actually help us. So that is where augmented reality is really, really all fundamentally altering um, and also low cost, the key low cost thing. Um, and so what are we seeing? Basically, speed and agility, back to my earlier point, being put into on a low cost basis the healthcare market and really speeding up how we, the patient, can actually be, be looked after. Elsewhere, what are we seeing? Um, 
let's see, in terms of um, customer predictive marketing, and I won't go into that in too much detail, because I know if you w really want to talk about that, then uh, Walid from uh, OMD is your absolute expert. But from the point of view of anticipatory shipping, this is, again, I think, fascinating. So, classic example, Amazon. What are we seeing Amazon doing? Top right, the idea of no longer um, waiting for that order to come in, and then having something taken from the warehouse, put through the, um, uh, the, to, through the system, into a um, delivery truck, and sent out to you the, uh, the buyer at your home address or whatever, but instead predicting demand and actually shipping on a predictive basis. So how are they doing this? What we're seeing now from Amazon is that they're looking at local areas and, on in, and by crunching all the data, working out what are the most and most frequently um, purchased items in that area. What they're then doing is having the, the, um, the delivery trucks go out there pre-filled with presumed potential orders, meaning that you, the customer, when you then basically buy uh, on, a sort of a, on a copying basis uh, what the, uh, people have bought in that same area in the past, um, have that delivery that much quicker. So what they're doing is fundamentally altering how they're actually using those delivery trucks. Delivery trucks now are being used as mobile warehouses, and they themselves are then being restocked. So the whole issue of actually how that pattern, how that, um, how that route is taking place, is fundamentally altered. Elsewhere, um, bottom right there, so Shenzhen, the uh, production capital of the world. So basically, whatever it is that's in your pocket, in terms of your smartphone, that's where it's made. And what are we seeing in Shenzhen um, is uh, the uh, famous or infamous um, electronics components market. Electronics component market is absolutely fascinating. As they say, what they'll do there is they, where they not only make what's in your pocket, they'll also edit it, inverted commas. So if you want um, an iPhone with two batteries um, or two SIM cards, someone in there will do it for you. Now, on an IP basis, if you or I, if we were back in, I was back in the States, if I hacked an iPhone, I'd probably go to jail. In Shenzhen, they'll do it for you in store, in front of you. Uh, I heard someone recently, I gave a talk with a uh, fantastic woman from Wired magazine, and she's literally just been to the uh, components market again, actually, the previous week. And she said she talked about this with a couple of people there, and they said, what you call stealing, we call sharing. <laughs> fantastic uh, sort, of a, sort of a quote. Um, but that idea of, uh, of a completely different way of looking at um, sort of editing, hacking technology is absolutely fascinating there. Um, elsewhere, top left. So how does this impact on the communications market? Well, I think one company in particular is really, really center stage at the moment, uh, or will be very soon, um, and that is a company called Emotient, who have just been bought by Apple. Um, now, Emotient basically make um, uh, emotional, emotional and, uh, and facial recognition software. And Emotient um, software is now going into basically, or will be going into every Apple device that has a camera. So classic examples of this in terms of how it impacts the communications industry. So let's say um, um, sort of a, so, uh, so ad drones. Ad drones using facial recognition software in a crowd environment can now start bringing you, or will soon start bringing you, um, incredibly fine-tuned personal or small grouping relevant advertising as opposed to bland, one-size-fits-all advertising that may currently be, uh, be, be working. And so the idea of, say, facial recognition and emotional, and emotional recognition software completely impacting the communications market is, I think, absolutely fascinating. Uh, next up is this, and that is why less is more is one of the really, really big things, which goes against a lot of the, or links into, um, but bumps up against it, a lot of the other trends we're seeing at the moment. So, less is more. So what are we seeing? So, uh, the last few years, or the last few let's say, is a sweeping statement. S uh, since about uh, 1900, we've been told that big is best. So the bigger the corporation, corporations buying up other corporations, um, monopolies being set up in many cases, um, you know, big is, more, big is better has basically always been sold to us, is the way that capitalism eventually basically works, and that's how markets operate efficiently. 
until obviously we saw the financial crash and we realized that actually when it comes to the banking sector, perhaps big isn't best. So we're also seeing this now um, linking into an incredible number of other sectors. For instance, um, we're seeing the amount of grassroots initiatives taking place are quite phenomenal. We're seeing the idea of autonomy really, really taking off. We're seeing the idea of small groupings, local-based activity, community-based activity, impacting, say, on both politics uh, and big business. From the point of view of we're seeing you know, less and less people being satisfied with and trusting, and obviously trust has been one of the big trends of the last couple of years that you all have been talking about, no doubt, in your sort of, in your, in sort of brand planning meetings. But what are we seeing when, to a great extent, the population doesn't like the idea of politicians being um, withholden to big unions or big business? Small is better. So we're seeing people demanding choice and diversity and efficiency from their systems, be either public services um, on a health basis, as mentioned earlier, on a general political basis or from a brand basis, when often what they get is completely the opposite. So when one is trying to drive loyalty, the idea, uh, and when one is linking into a, an increasingly big social trend, I think this idea of less is more is absolutely fundamental. The, uh, the World Economic Forum, not the world's um, uh, sort of a body that's most given to uh, outrageous thinking or outlandish thinking, they did a big report into autonomy uh, along with McKinsey, and what did they see? Giving workers more autonomy, either in the agency or in the business or in the big corporate, whatever, what does it do? It drives um, happiness massively and it drives productivity absolutely as well. So the idea of autonomy being big is a really, really key issue. So less is more. Hence books like Less is More, um, um, which came out by, uh, written by Adam Lent, published last week. It's fantastic. Elsewhere, we see books like um, More Human, um, um, absolutely superb by Steve Gibbons. Um, but how is it also linking into um, a trend that links into, uh, that neatly fits in today? I'd say this from the point of view of desire and demand. The idea, for instance, in retail. What are we seeing in retail? Two months ago, I was over here at the uh, speaking at the World Retail Congress, and you know, biggest retail congress in the world. And what do we see there? One of the biggest trends spoken about was the idea of brand experience. Now, recently, um, Adweek in the States put out a big report. What do they see? I think it's 83 percent. To give it its exact figure, 83% um, of brand teams said that experience was had moved far higher up the brand uh, and particularly retail agenda than it had been five years ago. So the idea of basically, um, so how is that being replicated in store? Well, less is more. Um, and so the idea of experiences being going up and up and up. You know, retailers offering more experiences as opposed to purely trying to shove more things um, in front of cons potential consumers being played out in a couple of ways. One, obviously, was the idea of um, afterwards, how they'd react to that experience. And I gave a talk last week with the head of marketing from uh, Instagram, who is a fantastic guy and just I'm in awe of Instagram. And what did he say there? One of the key things they, they see is Instagrammable retail is massive. If you can't talk about it afterwards, if you can't share it afterwards, if you can't look at it afterwards, there's no point actually going there. And we can see that impacting everything from the, let's say the entertainment market, you know, the clubbing market, the bar market, the holiday market, or whatever, absolutely huge. Um, but that, I think, is, is absolutely fundamental. So how is this all linking into communication? I think all of the trends I've spoken about, or the few trends I've spoken about, link into, you know, clearly link into trends that no doubt we all think about. So content marketing, conversational marketing, the idea of um, um, sort of you know um, uh, ever more fine-tuned um, precision targeting, uh, of which OMD obviously are the absolute masters. The idea of uh, let's say um, brand purpose, which has been spoken about hugely over the last couple of years. Brand purpose, by the way, was uh, was uh, noted last week by Campaign Magazine is now moving into its next stage. So what are we seeing there? As they reported, um, basically the next rendition, if you like, of brand purpose is humane capitalism. And humane capitalism, as they termed it, is a situation whereby people are wanting not only to buy, buy into 
ethically correct brands, brands that have been bought with a sort of a, with a societal goodness uh, uh, at its heart, but also from the point of view of um, that like brand good thing being done on an aspirational basis as well. So humane capitalism, they would say, is the next big thing. Um, last slide on that um, is uh, this one. So pattern recognition. The idea that I'll just talk about here is this. So pattern recognition, obviously, the great book by that great futurist writer, William Gibson, uh, that came out a few years ago when, when William wrote it. I was luckily uh, I was, I was invited to interview him for uh, Dazed and Confused magazine. Um, and you know, one of the things he mentioned in that book was that incredibly famous quote that we all use, no doubt, we've all heard, which is that, you know, the future's already here, it's just not very well distributed. And that quote's used endlessly and how accurate it is. Um, but What's my take on it? It's things like this. So one of the biggest problems I see when I'm speaking with people like yourselves, and no doubt you talk about it a lot as well, is the idea of how to sift through the amount of data you get, how to sift through the amount of trends that you hear about, because you know you can obviously just you know download any amount of sort of trend reports, and most of them are ridiculous. Um, lots of great looking images, very futuristic, but what does it actually mean to you as a brand marketer? Very little. How genuinely usable are they is often. How can I use it in my business is really, I think, the most obvious point that's often made. Uh, and so what I'd say is, from my point of view, um, when one's looking at trends, when you're looking at scenario planning, when you're um, trying to sort of sort out the stuff that's believable and useful, I tend to go personally to, I know it's an incredibly obvious list, but it's a great list um, of really, really fantastic brands here that are at the top of their game. And so my angle is, if these people are reporting on something on a, uh, on a, sort of, on a regular basis, or if they're all talking about something, then quite frankly, you know, uh, one can take it as read that actually this is real, this is meaningful, they're actually up to something. Along with, obviously, when you're going through titles like this, and you'll all have your own favorites, and by the way, if you have any others that are superb, please tell me afterwards. I'm always uh, <laughs> definitely interested in, in finding out what else is out there. But also, along with the pattern recognition side of things, the machine learning side, seeing what everyone's talking about, to me, it's also obviously fascinating looking at titles like this, or business consultancies like this, um, uh, or think tanks like this, or universities like this, or talking arenas like this, uh, and seeing what are the anomalies, which things are jumping out that make you think, whoa, bang, the next big thing. That's fascinating. But to me, what does it all mean from the point of view of um, linking into a sharing culture, an on-demand economy, and less is more? Well, to me, you know, the key sectors, as I put there, um, in terms of summing this up, are peer-to-peer -peer accommodation and transportation, on-demand household and uh, professional services, uh, and then open source collaborative um, um, sort of behavior. That's where it all currently is emerging, and that, I think, is just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger on an almost completely cross-sector basis. You know, so it means for, let's say, the um, hospitality market, lots more um, um, focus on things like, uh, let's say, localism, uh, customization. For the motor market, it looks at things like um, rethinking the customer um, uh, value equation. Why bother sharing? Why bother uh, owning? Um, why just not do something? Uh, why not do one or the other? Um, from the point of view, let's say, um, of the media market or the communications market, looking at shared hubs, um, looking at multi ownership, looking at shared ownership of actually that viewing platform, um, uh, and elsewhere. How's it all being wrapped up? I'd say this, in the last sort of minute I have, so linking all these trends together, linking all the, the idea of pattern recognition together, um, looking at all this, and, they, and then saying to yourself, which ones do I actually believe? Which ones are useful to me? Um, I would say this, I'd say basically I agree 100% with the great futurist writer, uh, William Gibson, because when he summed this up in the book, what he said was this, he said, basically, we have no genuine idea of what the future may hold because the past is, and the present is too volatile. We have only risk management. The spinning of the given moment's scenarios. Pattern recognition. Thank you. <laughs>